in order to fully understand the book of Revelation, uh, which for a lot of people and churches and even pastors, believe it or not, they won't touch the book of Revelation with a 10-foot pole. It's too weird. It's too abstract, they think. And a lot of people shy away from studying this book. And I want it to be said at the onset of our study that God, uh, really, that our goal would be that God receives all the glory for what he does as this book is taught, as it's discussed, and as we learn more about who Jesus is through our study in the book of Revelation. And then secondly, that you might grow in your understanding of God's word to the extent that you might fully know or more fully know God's plan for you and for his church, for the nation of Israel, and what's happening in this world. So, you ready for it? Here we go. Revelation chapter 1, verse 3, it says, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. Now, I don't know about you, but I am all for the blessings of the Lord. I, if, if it comes down to the Lord saying, hey, if you do this, I'll bless you. Sign me up, Lord. I am all in. I don't know if there are any more of you like that out here tonight. But I think as a church, we should be able to unanimously say, Lord, if I read in your word that if I hear it and I do it, that I'm blessed, then I want to be a hearer and I want to be a doer of the things that are written here in the book of Revelation. Because if we do those things, we will receive a blessing from the Lord. And that's what I intend for all of us, that we study this book and that we receive blessings from the Lord. Charles C. Ryrie said this, and I quote, Eschatology seems to suffer at the hands of both of its friends and foes. Those who play it down usually avoid assigning specific meaning to prophetic texts. Those who play it up often assign too much, but the prophetic portions of the Bible won't go away. End of quote. So though we'll cover a myriad of different viewpoints, different topics, uh, we'll be coming as a church, as a Calvary Chapel, from the position of being dispensational, having a pre-tribulational view and a premillennial uh, viewpoint. And I like to break those down for you because I hope to define terms that are used very frequently that often kind of go like this over uh, the church's head. I think it's important for us to understand what the Bible says and to know the terms that are being used. So dispensationalism, if you've ever heard that and wondered what that means, it means that God is dispensing his plan, his will, and his methods for accomplishing his work in various stages and with different degrees of revelation of those dispensations. Now, there are seven dispensations in the scriptures that are agreed upon. So if you're taking notes, if you like to watch this and uh, at a later time and write these things down, you can. Here are the seven. The dispensation of innocence or freedom. Number two, the dispensation of conscience or self-determination. Number three, the dispensation of civil government. Number four, the dispensation of promise or patriarchal rule. Number five, the dispensation of law. Now you're starting to see, oh, Abraham, I get it. Dispensation of law, the law of Moses. Number six, the dispensation of grace. And then finally, number seven, the dispensation of the kingdom or millennia. Now, for those that hold a pre-tribulational view, the rapture of the church will take place before the seven-year period of tribulation on earth. This is to be distinguished from the mid- and the post-tribulational views that mean exactly what they sound. Pre-trib means before the tribulation, mid-trib is a halfway point, and post-trib is after the seven-year period of the tribulation. So if we're saying we're coming at the study of the book of Revelation from a dispensationalist point of view, from a pre-tribulational point of view, and then thirdly, a premillennial point of view, this is a reference to the second coming of Jesus Christ taking place before his millennial reign, that thousand-year reign of Christ, that Jesus will come down, touch foot to earth, and then we will see the rule of Jesus upon this earth. Now, there are many different views on these subjects. And if somebody is here tonight or you know of somebody that may not hold these certain views that, uh, and other ones that we'll touch upon, those that are typical views of a Calvary Chapel, this does not mean that if someone believes something differently that they're not saved. 
This is important. I think it's important to point this out, that those that believe in such a way that might be a little bit different, if they're mid-trib or post-trib, I mean, if you believe that you're going to go through the, the tribulation and that's your view, uh, you can have that view, and that's that's between you and the Lord and what you've studied. But I'm just letting you know like where we're coming from. So here is your next term, eschatology. Eschatology is the study of the last days or end times. And it actually begins with the number six dispensation, which is the dispensation of grace, meaning that when Jesus came and died on the cross, the law was done away with, and now grace, through grace you've been saved, through faith. And so Jesus dying on the cross marks the six of the seven dispensations that you will see in history. And so studying the Bible, what it has to say about the last days is uh, precisely what we're going to be doing as we study through the book of Revelation. Revelation means unveiling. So there is a pulling back of the veil so that you might see things that were previously hidden. So Revelation means unveiling, where we get our English word apocalyptic. Now, Hollywood has kind of taken this word and run with it, where you think of these apocalyptic natural disasters. And, and you know, they're not too far off because the Bible actually tells us that there are going to be some pretty terrible things that will happen on this earth during the Great Tribulation. And it's described for us in the book of Revelation, what we see as the church, uh, as the Holy Spirit pulls back that curtain to hidden future events that allow us to see the fulfillment of God's plan and ultimately the glorifying of Christ revealed. Now, Daniel, and we're going to get into this, and, and listen, this is just an introduction tonight that we'll be going through, but we plan on taking our time and going through this so that you know this book inside and out. But in Daniel chapter 12, verse 4, it says, But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. So in Daniel, the Lord tells him, shut up the words. Close it down. There's going to be a time for that. But this is exactly the opposite of what John was told regarding the vision from the Lord that he received concerning the end times. Revelation 22 verse 10 says, And he said to me, Do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. And so for us, as we study the book of Revelation, this is an open book to God's plan for the future. And we're going to study it in depthly. Now, there was an American humorist from the late, mid, mid 1800s or so. His name was Josh Billings. And that was actually his stage name. His real name was Henry Wheeler Shaw. And he was a pretty funny guy. And he took a lot of the jargon of the day and, and the grammatical errors and, and some of the euphemisms that were around uh, about the Civil War time. And he said this, and I quote, don't ever prophesy. For if you prophesy wrong, nobody will forget it. And if you prophesy right, nobody will remember it. End of quote. You know, there have been a lot of prophecies that have been made and found to be not true throughout history. You can look at Nostradamus or as recently as, you know, Greta Thunberg deleting her tweet, you know, that uh, the world would end in 2023 or whatever it might be. Yet there for us remains the prophecies found in the Bible. They have not gone away. Jesus said this world will pass away, but the word will not. And we have these prophecies found in the scriptures that only God, who is outside of time, can share with his people things that were to happen before they actually happened. You know, some scholars believe that there are more than 300 prophecies. Do you, can you believe this? Over 300 prophecies concerning Jesus in the Old Testament. 300. And these prophecies are specific enough that the mathematical probability of Jesus fulfilling even a handful of them, let alone all of them, is staggeringly improbable, if not impossible. And so there was a man by the name of Peter Stoner. He's the chairman of the Department of Mathematics and Astronomy at uh, Pasadena College. Yeah, and he was passionate about biblical prophecies. And with 600 students from the InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, 
Uh, Stoner looked at eight specific prophecies about Jesus, and they came up with an extremely, some would say, conservative uh, probabilities for one being fulfilled, and then considered the likelihood of Jesus fulfilling all eight of those prophecies. So here was the conclusion to his research. It was staggering. The prospect that any one person could satisfy those eight prophecies was one to one uh, to the ten, uh, excuse me, uh, one in ten to the 17th power. So one, that was the the probability of that happening. One in 10 to the 17th power. Uh, In science speak, it's kind of described as this. And he said this, and I quote, let us try to visualize this chance. If you mark one of 10 tickets and place all the tickets in a hat and thoroughly stir them, then ask a blindfolded man to draw one. His chance of getting that right or the right ticket is one in 10. Suppose we take that 10 to the 17th power of silver dollars, and maybe you've heard this, I found this fascinating, and lay them on the face of Texas. They will cover all of the state of Texas, and it would be two feet deep of silver dollars. Now mark one of these silver dollars, stir the whole mass thoroughly all over the state. Blindfold a man and tell him he can travel as far as he wishes, but he must pick up one silver dollar and say, this is the right one. What chance would he have of getting the right one? Well, he goes on to say that just the same chance that the prophets would have had of writing these eight prophecies and having them all come true in any one man from their day to the present time, providing they wrote using their own wisdom, end of quote. So cover the state of Texas in silver dollars, two feet high, mark one, have a blindfolded man or blind man try to walk the state and find it, That's the chance of Jesus fulfilling eight prophecies in the Old Testament. There were over 300. So many of the words that are found in the book of Revelation, and you'll notice this, and this is where people kind of go, whoa, 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 this is really weird. I don't know if I want to read this anymore. But many of the words found in the book of Revelation are written in symbolic language with metaphors. But you don't have to be lost there. And you want to know why? It's because the metaphors are actually found in the Old Testament as well. And so what you'll see is that there is a pattern uh, that the Lord uses or employs when using symbols symbolism. So with the symbolic language in Revelation, it's important to understand that we have ranging between low estimates of 404 and as high as 550 references of Hebrew scriptures are found in the book of Revelation alone. So we're looking at close to average about 500 500 references to the Old Testament found in the book of Revelation. So when you're looking at symbolism, you need to be cautious. And there's two reasons why you want to be cautious when you're reading things that are symbolic. On one hand, there is a view that because symbolism is being used, you'll never know for sure what anything means. Oh, this is the most random stuff I've ever read. I mean, what in the world is this? Some giant beast comes out of the water and, you know, it looks like this. And then there's this woman over here and then this long claws here and there's horns growing off somebody's head over there. I mean, what does this even mean? And some will say it's just this good versus evil and good wins in the end. And you can't really know for sure what anything means because it's symbolic. On the other hand, Symbolism has also been used in such a way where it fuels sensationalism. Uh, It fuels speculation or an attempt to, you know, fit current events regardless of the age into the letter. And that's where where you'll see people make prophecies about things that Jesus is coming back at this time or, you know, this is what this means with this world leader. And then time goes by and you realize it was completely not true. And sure, you can make mistakes, but you fall into the danger of it if you don't understand symbolism correctly. And so here's the balance. As you study the book of Revelation for yourself, here's what you need to know. The Bible uses the vast majority of symbolism in a consistent manner. Though there are noted exceptions, and those things will be highlighted, for the vast majority, the symbolism is the same. What it meant in the beginning is what it means in the end, and you can learn from those things that are already written in the Bible. Now, we have... uh, a very mixed bag in the church in, uh, in the United States when it comes to different views of the book of Revelation. 
And for some people, you'll use words such as preterist or a historical view, or an allegorical view, or a futurist view. And you might, if I were to ask you tonight, hey, when it comes to the book of Revelation, uh, what view do you hold? Are, are, are you a preterist? Or do you believe in an allegorical view? Are you a historical uh, person, that, uh, a view that, uh, do, you have, do you hold a historical view? Or are you a futurist? And you might think, I have no clue. And it's like, maybe I should just pick one. I mean, historical sounds pretty good, right? Or, you know, maybe futurist. Uh, I'm not sure. Well, I'd like to break these things down for you real quickly because this is what you need to know. And when I'm studying things, I love it when somebody in books that I'm reading where somebody just says, hey, this is what you need to know. So for you tonight, I'll do the study so I can tell you this is what you need to know. And here we go. So when it comes down to understanding the different viewpoints, there are few, there are four views of eschatology. There are four main views. Okay, I'm going to give you a group of four uh, views of eschatology, and then I'm going to give you a group of four ways of studying eschatology or the end times, or what does the whole Bible have to say about the end times. So here's the first view. Uh, not in order of importance, but just broken down for you. Preterist. If someone was to say, I view end times with a preterist viewpoint, this view holds that the book of Revelation was fulfilled in its entirety by the time Jerusalem was uh, destroyed in AD 70. So they're saying that the book of Revelation was already fulfilled. They'll say, and there are actually some popular YouTubers that will say, yeah, you know, the rapture, it could be used to describe when a a Roman uh, 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 commander would come into town and everybody would be caught outside. And there's a view that you would need to be aware of that is called the preterist view. And it's just missing one major event. And that's Christ's physical reign on earth. That's kind of a big deal. If you hold to that viewpoint, you're missing something pretty major. Secondly, the historical view claims that all of the church is history. So all church history from the apostolic times to the present is a panorama view of the events of Revelation. A panorama uh, a view of everything that uh, you uh, could possibly imagine, but it would also cause you to have to bend and stretch and really reach far uh, when you are looking at history and prophecy. You have to twist some things around to get to a historical view. The third view is an allegorical view where it says that revelation isn't historical or literal. It's an allegory as you no doubt, deducted from its name, but it's a series of symbols that, you know, depict this ongoing battle between good and evil. Uh, This view, if you say that it's just allegorical, if you would hold to this view, it means that you must dismiss all of the prophecies in the Old Testament and all of the prophecies in Revelation. So none of it is true. None of it is specific. It's all allegorical. So you're dismissing all the Old Testament and you're dismissing everything in Revelation. Fourthly and finally, the futurists. I'll just read this to you. This keeps with the structure of the book and holds that part of Revelation has been fulfilled, which are the letters to the churches in chapters 1 through 3, while everything in chapters 6 through 22 has yet to be fulfilled. This view is actually the best view that aligns with Scripture, uh, particularly with Jesus' message in Matthew chapter 24. It's also the only view that maintains a constant line of interpretation based upon context, which is very important, grammar, and biblical history. And so if I were to tell you what I am today, I would fall in at number four as a futurist. I don't believe that the book of Revelation is allegorical. I don't believe that it's already been fulfilled in AD 70. And this is the view that I believe is the most accurate. So as we embark upon the study in Revelation, uh, now here's your next four things that you're going to want to know. The four rules for studying eschatology were actually kind of uh, uh, created by this man who is now with the Lord, but his name was David L. Cooper. He was the founder and director of the Biblical Research Society, and this is number one if you're taking notes. This is called the Golden Rule of Interpretation. 
It says this, all biblical passages are to be taken exactly as they read unless there is something in the text indicating that it should be taken some way other than literally. Meaning that you read it, it reads what it, you know, it means what it says unless it's noted otherwise. Uh, Secondly, this is called the law of double reference. It observes the fact that often a passage or a block of scripture is speaking of two different persons or two different events that are separated by a long time. Meaning that there can be in a passage of scripture, uh, two different events, as I read, or two different people that is being uh, referenced there. Uh, The third law is the law of recurrence. Uh, This basically states that in the same passage of, well, in one passage of scripture, you'll have a record of something. And then there'll be a second passage of scripture that records the same event, but gives you more detail, the law of recurrence. And then fourthly and finally, the law of context. Uh, This is a text apart from its context is pretext. It just means if you read something out of context, you're not going to truly know what it is actually saying. You must always study the Bible in the context that it is written. That's how you know what the Bible says. Major heresies that have come through church history have come because people isolated verses from the text. Major problems in personal relationships with with the Lord have come because uh, I read something that was an isolated verse. I pulled it out and I made it mean something to me that it did not mean. And so... The book of Revelation, believe it or not, is a very easy book to follow. And I hope that you see that by the end of our study uh, through Revelation. Uh, It will give you your own breakdown, your own key to understanding it. If you look at Revelation chapter 1, would you look at verse 19? Verse 19 of Revelation chapter 1. It says, write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after this. These are the three sections of the book of Revelation. The things that John saw in his vision, Revelation chapter 1, the things which are the seven churches recorded for us in Revelation 2 and and 3, and then thirdly, the things which are to come, which is where we will have some exciting times in Revelation chapter 4, all the way till the end, Revelation chapter 22. This is where we want to be. As we look at the introduction, as we look at the seven churches that are written to, they describe churches in the present. They also were actual churches that were written to. The spirit behind the church, the character flaws, if you will, the things that we kind of touched on in in our last couple sessions here with Pastor Raul and Pastor Jack, as we looked at the roles of the church and how the church can lose its uh, place of loving Jesus first. And there's going to be a whole bunch of things that we'll glean from as we study the seven churches of Revelation. So here's our introduction now to the actual study. We know that the author is John because he mentions such four times in Revelation. This is the same John that wrote the Gospel of John and the little three uh, epistles, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Uh, John is the only one of the four gospel writers to refer to himself as the, as the disciple whom Jesus loved. Uh, you know, that's kind of basically saying, I'm Jesus' favorite, and I want you all to know that. And uh, that's usually what I say. Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm your favorite, Lord, I know. Uh, I know that's why, you know, those challenges happen to other people, but, but not me, Lord. I, I'm, I'm your favorite, the one whom you love. Come on, Lord. Uh, And so John is the author of the uh, the letter uh, that we refer to as Revelation. Um, It's important to note that we also have external evidence to the authorship of Revelation being John uh, from church history. Uh, Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, Clement of Alexandria, and Tertullian are all witnesses to such. And you'll also notice as we study Revelation that there are certain similarities uh, to the Gospel of John. So in the Gospel of John and in Revelation are the only times that you'll see uh, Jesus referred to as the Word. You also will see in the Gospel of John and in Revelation that Jesus is referred to as the Lamb. You know, as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Now, 
I'm very, very thankful that the Lord has laid out in advance the things that are going to happen in our world. Because when you start looking at the things that we read every single day in the news, uh, it, it's very disconcerting. It's very disheartening at times because you think, man, things are starting to get really, really bad. And have you noticed like how fast they've gotten bad? Have you noticed like how fast evil has reared its ugly head? Have you noticed like how quickly things just came out of nowhere when I, you know, actually having four kids and aware of what's happening in the families of our, of our church with their children in public schools and with, with, with the type of material and curriculum and study that kids are doing in public schools? Did you happen to notice that once an issue hit, it was rolled out in schools immediately? Did you see that? Did you notice that? Like, where was this just waiting in the pipeline that the moment you talk about this subject, we press this button and then it goes everywhere and our kids are being taught it? Because we know that in the last days, the world is going to get more and more wicked. We know that because Satan's days are drawing to a close, that he's going to do one final push to try to get as many people to hell with him. You know, I think one of the best ways I, that I can describe this is if Satan already knows that he's going to hell, he would love to take as many people with him there. Because man was created in the image of God. We were created to know God. You were created to know your creator, to have a personal relationship with God, not just some distant uh, uh, force in the, in the sky, not the big man upstairs, as he's often disrespectfully referred to, but a personable God who loves you, who knows everything about you who's concerned with every detail of your life, who created you irreplaceable, who has given you a future and a hope. And I remember, you know, being in high school years and years ago, and maybe you can recollect being at a pool party where, you know, you might have the grave misfortune of standing by the edge of the pool with your keys, with your phone, with your wallet, and your friends have that look in their eye like you're going in. And maybe you had that experience, as I did, where you get tossed in the pool, you know, and uh, that's not a good place to be. And you kind of learn really quick that if you ever go to a pool party, you don't stand near the edge because it's just waiting to happen. You're asking for it. And I thought about that for a, for, for a moment. I was thinking, you know, what would I do if I was going in that pool? Well, I'll tell you, I'd start gouging eyes and pulling hair and grabbing people's clothes. And I'd basically be saying like, hey, if I'm going in, you're coming in with me. And, and, and I think that's the same way for, for, for Satan because he is going to a place called the lake of fire. And that is not going to ever stop, be stopped from happening. That's already appointed. We're going to see it in the book of Revelation. Yet he's going to try to bring as many people with him. If I'm going in, then you're going in and she's going in and he's going in and he wants to bring as many with him as possible. But the reason why Jesus came and died was to seek and to save that which was lost, to give us an opportunity to know our creator, to have our sins forgiven, to not be fearful of the evil that's in this world, but to overcome evil with good. Jesus even said, and you remember, in this world, you have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And so as we study these end times, as we look at the prophecies found in the scriptures, we should bring, it should bring us reassurance. It should bring us to that point where we say, Lord, I look to you. I trust in you. I believe in your word. Lord, give me wisdom. How must I be better prepared? How, Lord, can I be used to reach people in these last days? Because these are exciting days that we're living in. And you know, Satan is all about the, the smoke screen and he wants to come across as, as if he's, you know, bigger than life and he wants to intimidate you. But greater is he who's in you than he who's in the world. Can I get an amen from the church tonight? And so when you see evil being raised up and it seems like there are more with them than there are with us, with God, we have the majority. With God, we have the victory. And it's nothing for the Lord to save with many or with few. And as you've heard me say before, and this seems to be just something that I'm holding on to, that it's nothing for the Lord to do anything with anyone at any time. And that's what we hold on to. And that's why we stay close to the Lord. And that's why we study his word. And so John, what a great example 
one of the disciples of Jesus, one of the inner circles, one of those that was just busy about his father's business as his master was. You know, John was arrested in Ephesus as he was encouraging the churches and he was sentenced or exiled to a 17 square mile island called Patmos. You don't want to go there. It was actually a penal colony. He wrote this letter that uh, we're reading of tonight during the reign of the Roman emperor Titus Flavius Domitian. This was a real man, a real emperor. We studied this in history class. John was alive during that day, planting churches, teaching the Bible, sharing the gospel, ministering to the church. Historical context is so important when we're studying this letter, this revelation of Jesus Christ. We believe that this was true to be so under the reign of Domitian because when Paul is writing his letters, as he's addressing the churches in Asia, there are a couple things that you need to be aware of when you're looking at the genuine authorship of this letter being John. Not only does he say it, not only do early church fathers uh, confirm that, but if we start looking at the surroundings of this letter, the churches in Asia were strong. There was not enough time to see the spiritual decay that we'll read of in Revelation uh, 2 and 3 about the seven churches. We also will notice this group of people called the Nicolaitans. In all of Paul's writing, this heretical sect had not yet risen. And so we see that a longer uh, or further out uh, date actually substantiates the things that we see here in this letter. And it's important for us to understand that God's timing is perfect and everything that we study is for an appointed time. Even as the things that are past have had an appointed time, the things in the future do as well. And I've often tried to rush God's plan. I don't know about you, but I have myself. You know, like, Lord, let's get this going. Let's get this show on the road. Lord, how come this isn't happening yet? You know, maybe you're single and you're wondering, how come I'm not married yet? You know, Lord, come on, let's get this show on the road. You know, maybe you need a job change. You know, like, Lord, how come I'm still in the same position? Lord, come on. What you'll see without a shadow of a doubt is that there is an appointed time for everything. There are no such things as coincidences. There's no random acts. We see from the scriptures and who God is that everything has an appointed time. Everything. Everything. And so as you wait on the Lord, trust in him. As you wait for whatever it is that you're waiting for, realize that God's appointed time may not be your appointed time, but it is the better of both your times. That's what you want. And as we study this letter, we're going to look at a couple things real quick. You'll notice that John records that the father gave this revelation to his son. And then the son shared it with John. And he did so via his angel or this uh, intermediary at times where this messenger of the Lord communicated to John. Uh, sometimes we'll see communicating to John is Jesus. Others may be an elder, but often it was an angel. Sometimes it was a voice from heaven. But whichever the case may be, we see that John received this vision of who Jesus is. It points to Jesus. It glorifies Jesus. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the central figure of this entire letter. Jesus, the law, the Psalms, the prophets spoke of him. Interwoven throughout the entire history of the Old Testament, Jesus. And now we get this exciting letter where we're starting to see the things unfold before our very eyes. How the mark of the beast can easily take place now. It makes sense to have a little chip on your hand. It makes sense to have all your medical records and financial records and driver's license and passports and whatever else you might need a record of on a tiny little dot on your hand that you can just scan. I mean, you can go to certain shops and you can scan your handprint and check out at Amazon. Hey, we just scan your hand. You know, you can scan your eye. 
It's going to make sense. You know, often I'll leave the house and I'm like, oh, man, I forgot my wallet. Oh, man, what a pain. Oh, can I just like implant my wallet in my hand? Or implant everything right above my, my eyebrow so, you know, it sits right above my glasses and I, I, I just, it scans me as I walk in. I mean, it makes total sense. I mean, it's actually very convenient. But there's going to come a time, and we're going to study it in the book of Revelation, where you will not be able to buy or sell unless you are personally worshiping the Antichrist and take his mark. You know, we joked about it, I think it was on opening night where, you know, a lot of those old Left Behind movies, uh, you know, showed people with giant barcodes tattooed on their foreheads. And we're like, "Ah, I don't know if that's going to work. I don't know if somebody's going to go for that. Uh, But nowadays we have the tech. People are chipping their dogs, their employees. You know, why not all the members of the One World Order? You know, what a great thing just to bring continuity and uh, like-mindedness to the entire globe. Let's have one world currency. Let's have one world, you know, passports. Let's have one. I mean, we go, I mean, how many years ago was it where you hop on a domestic flight and it says, hey, welcome to, no, 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 part of the One World Alliance. Whoa, this is really happening. This is crazy. But it's exciting because the Lord told us in advance, this is where we would be heading. But everything points back to Jesus. It does. And since Jesus' death on the cross and his ascension, he has gifted you as the church with the Holy Spirit. And he's begun to usher in what we refer to as the last days. The last days began with the church age. In Hebrews chapter 1, what we're studying on Sundays, it says in Hebrews 1 verses 1 through 2, God who at various times... And in various ways, spoken times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. Revelation is a revelation of Jesus Christ, his plan fulfilled on this earth. It brings a blessing to whoever reads it and lives by it. And there is such a blessing, I believe, to know that the Lord has encouragement for you during trying times. Now, I wonder if there are any of you here tonight that have ever felt like God has turned a blind eye or a deaf ear to you. That he's not aware of what's happening. He's not hearing your prayers. He's not seeing your plight, you know, your struggles or, you know, how how you're having a hard time. You know, maybe you're going through some things that are, Very, very difficult and very painful. Maybe you're even questioning, is God even real? Does God even hear prayers? Do prayers even work? I mean, why am I following the Lord when it seems like I'm just having these difficult times all of the time? There's such a blessing to know as you study the Bible, as you look at the book of Revelation, that in the midst of all the chaos, in the midst of all the problems, God is still on the throne. He is still in control and his plans are being fulfilled because the Christian church at this time was at this time that this was written was experiencing persecution in a terrible manner, a terrible manner. And Paul, as, as, as we, we read, he, he was the one ministering at so many key points in church history strengthening the churches, raising up leaders. John was not an exception to that. Paul was the one that sent letters to the seven churches in Rome and Corinth and Galatia and Ephesus, Philippi, Colossae, and Thessalonica. John sent his letter to seven churches as well. And we'll be looking at those seven churches are really the seven spiritual states of the church. You know, probably about five years ago or so, my family and I were going through a really, really difficult time. And, and I didn't think, and and even as a pastor of a church and, and this might be hard to, to hear, but it's the truth. There, there were things that were happening that I felt were, were just too much for me to bear. 
uh, things that were that we were struggling with that I thought were gonna they were gonna break us. And I remember just losing sleep and feeling burdened and 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 even just dealing with this uh, overwhelming feeling of being uh, just discouraged. And Lord, I don't see how anything good can come from this. And Lord, the more that I pray, it just seems like it gets worse. Like, what are the chances of that? And I remember the Lord spoke to me in that hour. And I hope that this ministers to you because it really, really helped me. Every single time I tried in my own effort to bring about a change or to do something about the problem, and I just found myself incapable of being able to do anything, I felt like the Lord just said, surrender it to me. Surrender it to me. Every time you hear something, every time you feel something, every time you don't know what to do, give that burden to me. Lay it down at my feet. I mean, Jesus said, come to me, all you who are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Mike, yoke is easy. My burden is light. And every time you feel overwhelmed with whatever it is that you might be overwhelmed with tonight, you can surrender it to the Lord. Lord, I give this to you. Every time that thought comes in my head, Lord, I surrender it to you. Every time that feeling, I feel it in the, in the deepest part of my heart and it makes me sick in my stomach, Lord, I surrender it to you. Lord, every time I feel overwhelmed, I surrender it to you. And as I was sitting there in my living room and I had a couple friends over and I just said, you know what? I feel like the Lord's told me to surrender all of this to him because I can't do anything to fix it. And just then, no joke, my phone buzzed. As soon as I said that, one of my buddies texted me and he says, I don't know if this is from the Lord or not, but I feel like the Lord told me to tell you, you need to surrender it to the Lord. True story. I know exactly where I was sitting at that exact moment. I almost looked at my phone and was like, you gotta be kidding me. Only the Lord can do such a thing as that. That confirmation from a brother in the Lord, led by the Holy Spirit, that the same thing that the Lord just put upon my heart, put upon his heart, and gave him the ability to say, hey, uh, take this for what it's worth, surrender it to the Lord. And the Lord reminded me, I'm in control of all things. You can try to fight your own battles, or you can let me be your defense. And history has shown that it goes well for the righteous and very ill for the wicked. And in the end, the Lord will not be mocked. In the end, the Lord will have your righteousness shine forth like the noonday. And so we're reminded in the book of Revelation that through the turmoil, through the struggles, and even now currently where we're at or where you're at individually, that you can look to Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith because he is on the throne and he is still in control and he is very well aware of what's going on in your life. What a great reminder for us as the church and for us as individuals that God is aware of everything. And all the things that we see happening in our world, and sometimes I have to turn my news off. Sometimes I have to turn social media off because I just can't take it anymore. It's like I'm overwhelmed by the evil that is in the world. I'm concerned about my, my kids growing up in this world where it's just getting bad. And we're seeing a generation of kids that are just being messed in their minds, perverted and twisted by Satan and his false doctrine of demons. And how much more so... Is the church needed today to stand for what is right, to proclaim the truth of the gospel, and to actually back it up with the way that you live? That's what we need today. That's why we study the word of God. And I hope that the Lord lights a fire in us because that's what we need. God is outside of time. He was the one that formed you in your mother's womb. He's known as the eternal one. He always existed. He currently exists and he always will exist. And so that's why he can tell his people, hey guys, this is going to happen. These are the signs to watch out for. They're going to say this and they're going to do that. And then the end is near. And we're living in such an exciting time as the church things that 
previous generations only wished that they could see or even maybe wrestled through in their own faith with God because the technology had not yet been invented yet. And now we're here and we see it and it's real. But God, because he's outside of time, is able to see the beginning from the end. And so you can step into the future confidently knowing that God already knows what is going to happen. That's why he's able in his omniscience to give us the information in advance pertaining to the last days. And so if you look at verses one through three, it says the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant, John who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. The time is near. In verse 1, God, it's described for us that God the Father gave God the Son, Jesus, this revelation. Jesus gave it to his messenger or the angel and the angel gave it to John, but there's a fifth party. That's you and me today. What an exciting group to belong to. That group that is now reading the book of Revelation where the world's powers are lining up what's happening over with Russia, with China, with the wars, with the rumors of wars, what's going to happen in the Middle East, what's going to happen with Jerusalem, what's going to happen with the, the Antichrist leading the people of Israel to rebuild their temple, what's happening and has happened with the development of the red heifer to offer on the altar. All of these things we're going to be studying and seeing in real time. Things that are current, things that are still ahead, but we are there. We are very, very close. And I'm not making any predictions because I already told you we don't do that. But what we do know is what God's word says. We'll use the Bible to study the Bible. And we're going to break these things down verse by verse, chapter by chapter, all the way through the book of Revelation. And so we'll continue our study next week as we dive into chapter one. The foundation has been laid. If you need to review this for some of the terms that you can file away for your own uh, information, you can do so. And then we're going to start taking this from an exegetical standpoint as we break down chapter one of Revelation next week. Would you please join with me as we pray? Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this evening. We thank you, Lord, that we were able to sort of get this ball rolling tonight with laying a common ground for everyone uh, to understand what we're going to be studying. Lord, as we look to you, we ask that you would give us wisdom and give us discernment. Lord, may we be aware of the discussions that are taking place within the church and outside the church. Lord, may we be able to cover all of our bases in knowing, Lord, what the terms are for things that are being challenged or for, for even misconceptions or improper false views on your word that we would know what the truth is so that we might share with those around us. And Lord, I ask that this church would be filled afresh with your Holy Spirit tonight. I ask, Lord, that as we see these things that are happening in this world, that we would grow in our excitement and our anticipation for Jesus coming back. May we be found ready. Lord, we don't want to be caught unaware. We do not want to be in a place where we're in sin when that trumpet sounds, Lord, or, or Lord, we don't want to be in a place that we ought not to be when it's our time to go. So Lord, I pray that you would help every person that's here tonight to come to that conclusion in their own heart that they would want to be ready for when it's time. There is an appointed time. And I ask, Lord, that if there are any here that might be kind of on the fence or one foot in and one foot out and miserable because they have too much of the church and 
knowledge of your word to enjoy the world and too much of the world to truly enjoy the relationship with Jesus. I pray, Lord. I pray that tonight, Lord, they would make that decision to completely surrender their life to you. And with every eye closed and head bowed, I don't know if you realize this or not, but today is March 16th. It's called 316 Day. It's a day that's been set aside to evangelize and to share that God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. If you're here this evening and you don't know Jesus personally and maybe the end times and the end of the world and the cataclysmic events and the tribulation and the antichrist and the one world order and all of these things are really frightening. Or maybe they have, at the least, just caused you to take a step back and think about important things in life. May you just know tonight that with Jesus, there is nothing for you to be fearful of. That through faith in Jesus, you overcome. Through faith in Jesus, your sins are forgiven. Your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. So when the roll in heaven is called, your name will be found there and you will be ushered into the presence of Jesus and spend eternity in heaven. This world is not your home if you're a follower of Jesus. It's also important to understand that as a follower of Jesus, this world is as close to hell as you will ever get. This is as bad as it gets. But if you're without Christ, this is as close to heaven as you will ever be. And that's a bad deal. That's a ripoff. Please don't accept that. I would ask that with every eye closed and head bowed, if you're here and you don't know Jesus personally and you would like to be forgiven of your sins, you would like to have all of your past mistakes wiped away. You would like to have assurance that when you breathe your last breath here on this earth, you'll breathe your first breath in the presence of God. If you've never given your life to Jesus and you like to be forgiven, if you want that void filled, it's a God-shaped void. Maybe you've tried filling it with relationships or things or experience, drugs, sex, whatever it might be. This world has a lot to offer as a substitute but it never brings fulfillment. The pleasure is temporal at best. But Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and life more abundantly. And so with every eye closed and head bowed, if you're here tonight and you don't know Jesus and you very simply, like yes or no, if you very simply would say, yes, I'd like my sins forgiven, I'd like to give my life to Jesus today, then would you just raise your hand and say, yes, that's me. Just hold your hand up. As everyone's praying, and church, please be praying for those that are making that decision tonight. Just hold your hand up and say, yeah, I, I like to be forgiven. I know I've done things that are wrong. I know that's called sin. It separates me from God. And also for those of you tonight that would say, you know what? At one time, I was so on fire for the Lord. Maybe you were raised in a Christian home. Maybe you went to church, but you've backslidden. You've walked away. What a great night tonight to rededicate your life to Jesus. And so I'm gonna ask if that's you and you need to rededicate your life to the Lord, then with every eye closed and head bowed, would you just raise your hand and say, yes, that's me. I'd like to recommit my life to Jesus tonight. And I'm gonna lead you in a very simple prayer. Anybody else? I see over there in the middle. Anybody else? Just raise your hand. Any last ones? Right on. For those of you that raised your hand and even those of you that didn't, I'm gonna lead you in a very simple prayer. If you'd like to repeat this prayer after me, if you're watching this online, you can pray this prayer as well. And just say, dear heavenly father, I know that I've sinned, but I ask that you would forgive me of my sin and fill me with your Holy Spirit. I thank you that you love me. I thank you that you sent Jesus to die for me. And I thank you that you have forgiven me of all my sin. Would you fill me with your love and your joy and your peace and give me your strength that I may be who you've created me to be for I give you my life today. In Jesus' name, 
Amen. Let's all stand. And Father, we thank you so much for this night. We thank you, Lord, for giving us this place that we can call our church home. We ask, Lord, that you would continue to use this place for the furtherance of your kingdom. I pray, Lord, that for every person that steps foot on this ground, Lord, would experience a touch from you, would feel the presence of your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, that your word is living, it's powerful, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. And I pray, Lord, that as we go about our business the rest of this week, tomorrow being Friday and the weekend, keep us safe, Lord. Bring us together as a church family again on Sunday. And Lord, I ask for those that have made that decision tonight to commit or recommit their life to you. May they know, Lord, that those who are in Christ are a new creation. The old things have passed away and behold, all has been made new. And so we praise you for the work that you've done here tonight. And we give you all the glory in Jesus' name. And all God's people say, amen, amen. <laughs>